The Vinaya tells the story of the Buddha. Right after his awakening, when he went to teach, he sought out the five brethren, the monks who had been looking after him during his austerities. And he said to them, I found the deathless. Let me teach you. If you do as I tell you, you'll be able to find it too. And at first they didn't believe him. The main reason they gave was because he had gone back on his austerities. But you also wonder, was there something inside of them that didn't believe it was possible for anybody? But the Buddha persisted. He said, it's, it's true, and I'll show you how to do it. That enthusiasm he had, he had found something really wonderful, found a new possibility that human beings can do, human beings can attain. They attain something deathless through their own efforts. That's quite a statement about the power of the mind. I was thinking about that this morning as we were having the funeral service. We had a number of people who were not Buddhists there, some of them from a Christian background. And a lot of the religions of the world basically say, you can't do this on your own, you need some outside help. But the Buddha is saying, you can do it. And your main obstacle is, on the one hand, what people have been telling you and that you've internalized. And on the other, it's those voices in the mind that are afraid, afraid of failure, afraid of who knows what. They're the voices of laziness. It sounds like a pretty daunting path. So they dismiss it, and they dismiss your ability to follow it. What happens is those voices are just placing limitations on you. And so a lot of what the practice is is learning how to overcome your own self-imposed limitations. This sense of who we are is basically made up of three different roles. There's the you who wants happiness and the you who might be able to provide it, and then the you who is the commentator. Sometimes it doesn't feel like you, sometimes it feels like it's coming from outside, because you've picked up voices from outside. But in internalizing them and making them part of the inner conversation, they become part of you. And all three of these senses of who you are have to be trained to overcome their limitations. Because sometimes the you who wants happiness is happy to have something easy and immediate. The you who's capable of providing that happiness tends to be comfortable in its old ways of doing things. Realizes that what it's been doing isn't perfect, but hey, what could be better? Or even if there could be something better, it's a lot of effort. And then there's the who's the commentator, who tends to be very critical, in fact so critical that sometimes people say, just get rid of your inner critic. Just learn to be happy with whatever. But you can do that only for a little while, and then you get dissatisfied. So you're trying to train all three of these different roles that you have, roles that you play to get rid of their limitations. This is one of the reasons why we take refuge in the Buddha. We take seriously the fact that he did find something deathless, and he taught it as a path that human beings can follow. As Ananda told the nun one time, you hear that other people have found the deathless, and you tell yourself, they did it, they're human beings. I'm a human being, why can't I? That thought, he said, is a type of conceit, but it's a very useful conceit to have on the path, that you are able to do these things. Many of us come from a background where we're told that that kind of conceit is opposed to the, to the practice, and it's more spiritual to have a very humble opinion of yourself. 
But if you constantly keep yourself down, that's not going to be skillful. So you have to look at the voices that say that you can't do this. And ask, where are they coming from? What do they know? When I was first ordained, I was staying in Watama I spent a lot of days up in the mountain by myself. And there was a constant tug of war inside. The part of me who wanted to practice, the part of me that was saying that this is a waste of time. You should be out doing something else to help other people. And I was able to identify where some of those critical voices came from. So I asked myself, what did that person know about the practice? Those people are totally ignorant. Why should I let their ignorance limit me? So sometimes it's good to identify where you get your attitudes, where these voices come from in the commentator, and see that they're pretty ignorant. Then you have to watch out for the voices that get their pleasure out of putting you down. And those are the ones you have to fight. It's a miserable pleasure. And again, you have to sort out where's the allure? What does the mind like about that kind of down putting voice? Sometimes you feel, well, I'm being realistic. But as William James, the American philosopher, pointed out, there are two kinds of truths in the world. There are the truths that you can know only when you put your desires aside, aside from your desire to know, and just look at the way things are, look at the orbits of the planets, that kind of thing. And there are other things that become true only when you want them. In other words, this is where the desires have to become part of it. And if you squash those desires, again, you're placing limitations on yourself. The desire to find true happiness is something to be encouraged. The desire to find something deathless, a happiness inside that doesn't die, doesn't change, that should be encouraged. The belief that you have it within you, the potentials to follow that path, that should be encouraged. So instead of getting rid of your inner critic, you have to train your inner critic to be helpful, to be useful. Tell the inner critic that you want the judgments that are like the judgments of a craftsperson working on a, say, working on a table. You cut the wood, you plane the wood, you put it together. And if you make a mistake, you don't just throw the table away and give up on making tables. You figure out how to compensate for it. You're judging a work in progress. That's the kind of judgment that's helpful, and it's a judgment for the sake of making it better. So as you meditate, think of any skills you've developed in the past, the type of voice that's required, the type of attitude that's required. This may take effort, this may take time, it may take a lot of energy, but it's going to be worth it. And you may not be good at it yet. You sit and meditate and you find your mind wandering all over the place. That doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that you've got work to do. So learn to develop a, an encouraging voice inside. Think of the Buddha's teachings. They said the four verbs they used to describe his teachings were, on the one hand, to instruct, in other words, to give information. And then to urge, rouse, and encourage. Okay, one quarter instruction and three quarters encouragement. Let that be the proportions in your inner voices. So the Buddha gives us all kinds of ways of thinking that can overcome our self-limiting attitudes. Think about what he said about how we shape the present moment. 
fabrication comes in three kinds. There's bodily, verbal, mental. Bodily is how you breathe. Verbal is how you talk to yourself. Mental consists of the perceptions you hold in mind, either the visual images you hold in mind or words you hold in mind to identify things. And then feelings. Pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And he gives instructions on how to do all those three in a skillful way. So you can shape a path inside to rouse the self as consumer who wants happiness, to want this, to convince the self as the producer that it's worth the effort and that you have the capabilities, and to train that inner voice of talking to you, the commentator, to be a helpful commentator, to be a helpful critic. Because you do want a critic inside when you're getting lazy, when you're getting off the path, when you're getting complacent. It's good to have somebody to arouse you. When you're getting carried away with yourself, it's good to have somebody to pull you, pull you back. But you want someone who does this skillfully. Thinking of the Buddhist instructions on right speech. In terms of his own speech, he would speak only what was true, beneficial, and timely. And timely meaning knowing when to be harsh, knowing when to be kind, gentle. I'm trying to develop those same standards for your own inner speech. Your inner critic says things that are true and beneficial, knowing when to be harsh, knowing when to be gentle. Because you can train all yourselves. It's how the power of the mind gets released from its limitations. So those are some of the possibilities that the Buddha wanted to teach us. He found this potential, he found this possibility, and it really was amazing. It's so amazing that he spent 45 years teaching it to anyone who wanted to listen. So when you start getting down on yourself, at least think of him, all the effort he went through to find this path, to teach it. And the path is still there for you to follow. And you'll be convinced that you can follow it and you will benefit from it. And Chama Hambo talks about how he had heard from the senior monks in Bangkok of that time that the path to Nirvana was closed, even the path to Jhana was closed. But something inside him said, that can't be true. But still, he was concerned, would it be a waste of time? Then he realized, as the Buddha said, that the path is timeless. And it's not there trying to kill you. It's trying to open the way to see how far the power of your mind can go.